your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition. Hello, I'm Naveen Day, and thanks for joining us for our Week in Review. The trial for Tamara Leach of Medicine Hat continued this week, along with her co-accused Chris Barber of Swift Current Saskatchewan. The two helped organize last year's Freedom Convoy in Ottawa and are accused of mischief and encouraging others to commit mischief, obstructing police and intimidation when they organized a large convoy of trucks into the nation's capital to protest against the federal government's COVID-19 restrictions. This week, the Crown showed videos of Barber trying to make the, ca the case that he and Leach used influence and control over a protest that was not peaceful. But in sharp contrast, while cross-examining an officer assigned to social media evidence, Barber's defense lawyer showed videos of Barber calling for peaceful behavior. In the video, Barber also thanked police for ensuring public safety during the protests and talked about lo the loving nature of the crowd. Haddam Keir is a lawyer with Charter Advocates Canada and joined Hal Roberts from Hamilton, Ontario to discuss the case. Haddam, will the video evidence being submitted help or hurt the defense team? They're trying to uh, establish that the protest as a whole was a mischief. Um, and actually one of the arguments that uh, arose is that the defense is already admitting that fact. And so they, they challenged what, what the point of bringing this additional evidence is. Um, but basically the... Uh, the Crown is leading this as a kind of background evidence. They're trying to establish the facts about the overall protest. Um, and then, you know, the, presumably their strategy would be then to connect Tamara and Chris to that, that overall picture that they're painting. Could either Chris Barber or Tamara Leach receive jail time if found guilty of the mischief and counselling charges? Usually people who are being charged with mischief have uh, maybe broken a window or, or committed some sort of a, an act of vandalism. Uh, that said, they are charged with mischief over 5,000, which is the more serious version of the offense. And uh, there is a range and it comes down ultimately to the, the impact of the offense. So from the Crown's perspective, uh, they're going to argue that this was a massive mischief that affected uh, the whole or at least a large part of the city of Ottawa and that uh, Chris and Tamara are culpable for that. Thanks so much, Adam. That was Adam Keir, lawyer with Charter Advocates Canada, joining us from Hamilton, Ontario. The province says it is making our streets safer by bringing in stricter bail protocols. Officials say the new legislation will also include targeted prosecution units to address violent crime in Calgary and Edmonton. Teams of Crown prosecutors with various areas of expertise will go after crime in Alberta's largest cities, especially in matters involving violence and targeting repeat offenders. These prosecutors will be tasked with familiarizing themselves with the downtown communities in Edmonton and Calgary and the types of crimes that are being committed. They will also be a key point of contact for law enforcement on files involving repeat violent offenders who are making our downtown communities unsafe to work, live, and do business. Well, it is now official. Cardston is no longer a dry town. Council voted 5-2 on Tuesday, passing a bylaw that alcohol can now be sold at restaurants and golf courses. The opening of liquor stores, however, is still prohibited in the town. Cardston has been booze-free since 1902. Mayor Maggie Cronin reacted to the vote. I want to say to my fellow councillors, thank you for the trust you have in the process. It's for you folks, it's not what you wanted. But yes, it might have a very changing effect on our town. We will not know until it happens. And do I have fears? I do. But I trust the people also. Back in 2014, two-thirds of Carson Council voted against allowing the sale of alcohol in their town. Well, it's late in the summer, but wildfire season is still in full force with more than 80 blazes still active in our province. This has been a particularly dry and hot summer, which has been a contributing factor to more than 1,000 wildfires in Alberta year to date. But all that may change once we head into winter. We spoke with the managing editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac and... Please brace yourself. The Almanac is predicting a very cold and very snowy winter for us. I think the one thing that I've noticed is that as far as the severity of the winter goes, um, in the prairies, 
Alberta is going to see really the the brunt of it. It's going to be ever so slightly less hardcore in, as we move east. So a little bit, tiny bit less severe in Saskatchewan, tiny bit less severe than that in Manitoba. That's really kind of the only trend that I've been able to spot. After the break, a controversial speaker is back in Lethbridge this weekend. Full details are coming up next. You may remember the former Mount Royal University professor suing the University of Lethbridge after cancelling her speech on wokeism. She went there anyway, only to be shouted at by student protesters. Frances Widowson has been speaking out against wokeism and its impact on society. She's in Lethbridge as one of three guest speakers scheduled to appear at the Lethbridge Public Library this weekend to speak on the topic. Earlier this week, Widowson joined Hal Roberts to discuss the lawsuit and what her critics are saying. Now, you and your group are suing the University of Lethbridge for what? Cancelling your talk on wokeism and not allowing free speech on campus? That's correct. So Paul Viminitz, Jonah Pickle, and myself, uh, Viminitz is a philosophy professor, Jonah Pickle is a student, and, and me are all suing the University of Lethbridge for uh, violating our freedom of expression rights. And Alberta is a very good place to do this because there are some court decisions which say that the charter does apply to universities. Uh, we want to push this issue because I think of all places in society, universities are places where you should be able to discuss ideas. And that is no longer possible in many universities in Alberta today. Now, many critics would argue that being woke is actually a good thing since we're aware of the social injustices taking place in society today. How do you respond to that? Well, I think um, there are some elements of wokeism which are not a problem, which is, as you say, being concerned about uh, various groups and their situation in society. The problem with wokeism, though, is it is when identity politics becomes totalitarian in nature. So it really is the autocratic character of wokeism that's the problem, and preventing any people, any person from pursuing the truth or engaging critically uh, with ideas is not beneficial for people. And it's especially harmful for groups that have a marginalized position in society because it's, it's through pursuing the truth and examining ideas that they can better understand their, the reason why they are so deprived in the existing economic and political system. Communities across southern Alberta are about to see original Blackfoot names come back to life. A project aiming to resurrect the Indigenous language using signage hopes the initiative will enrich the landscape, invite people to take an interest in the history of our region, and move closer towards reconciliation. Several economic development and tourism groups partnered with the Kaina Nation to fund the construction of these Blackfoot signs. South Crow originally had the idea, and it was inspired by looking through <laughs> some old documents in the Raymond Alberta's museum. And we found an article from like the fifties or something where it was talking about how there's Blackfoot names for all of the names of our communities in different locations around Southern Alberta. And why wouldn't there be the Blackfoot people have lived here for thousands of years. Um, and that kind of tweaked in my brain because we work on regional tourism projects. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if those names were front and center and we knew what they meant. And so went and started having some conversation and we took it to council out on the blood drive. And we said, this is what we'd like to do. This is why we'd like to do it. What do you think? And uh, they were, they were, they were in. So we pooled our funds. We went out and got an extra grant and we put together our pilot project to uh, basically roll out signage across the region. The project will invite communities, businesses, and institutions across the region to apply for up to $2,000 towards the cost of sign construction for their location. More information can be found on our website, bridgecitynews.ca. There are now 329 lab-confirmed cases of E. coli stemming from an outbreak at 11 Calgary daycare centres on September the 4th. Doctors say, however, there are fewer patients in hospital with serious complications. Officials say the increase in overall case numbers is mostly due to a delay in receiving lab results. 21 children are still in hospital, with most of them having issues with their kidneys. Seven patients are currently on dialysis. 
The Alberta government has launched a full investigation into the outbreak in Calgary. And while our frontline workers are caring for these symptomatic and sick children, our public health experts are investigating to determine what happened and how to stop an outbreak of this magnitude from ever, ever happening again. That work is underway and we are working with Alberta Health Services to determine the exact source of the contamination. We know that the source is very likely linked with the shared kitchen, but we do not know what in the kitchen caused it at this time. The Alberta NDP has demanded a full inquiry into the E. coli outbreak in Calgary as a horrible inspection record of the kitchen which served the daycares has surfaced, including reports of cockroaches that were allegedly found. Up next, more on the E. coli outbreak. A large E. coli outbreak at 11 daycare centres in Calgary has the government scrambling a bit to not only contain the outbreak, but also to tackle a bit of a communications crisis. To chat more about this in detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, who sat down with Hal Roberts. Take a look. So the government held sort of its first big press conference on, on this outbreak on Tuesday. Um, and the outbreak was, I believe, declared on September 4th, a week and a bit ago at any rate. And, and, and they said that, you know, they had a health inspection of this kitchen, found critical incidents, including pests, evidence of pests in the kitchen, which I believe were cockroaches, um, some sanitation things, stuff like that. So the, the public health team is doing this, like, it's quite a remarkable investigation, actually, when they lay it all out. You know, they, they're taking samples of food that was at the, at the um, facility. They're taking samples of leftovers that had been served. They're interviewing people who fell ill for their food histories. They're interviewing people who did not fall ill for their food histories. And, you know, trying to sort of triangulate a bit on what actually might be the, the sort of ground zero, I guess, patient zero or, or whatever the, the food was that caused this uh, outbreak. Um, it is worth noting, I mean, a number of, as you mentioned, of the kids in hospital are, are really, really ill, um, quite seriously ill. There's been blood transfusions, a number are on IV fluids, just because, you know, so many fluids are um, coming back out, I suppose, to put it uh, a little delicately. Um, and, and so they're under sort of close monitoring in hospital. There's three blood work clinics that have been set up at health centers around Calgary for people that need regular blood testing on this. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big public health issue um, for starters. But the other side of this is, as you mentioned, the communications part. And, and that has to do basically with the fact that the government didn't have a press conference for about a week. Um, and as I said, it was a very robust press conference, lots and lots of information given. But the question did come up, you know, why did you wait a week? Why was it so long before there was a press conference? And and the the line that the government gave was, look, we've been communicating with the the parents and the families um, before, you know, the broader public. And there was a bit of a gaffe when Dr. Mark Joffe, the chief medical officer of health, said, you know, he didn't feel any urgency to sort of update the public. And of course, he immediately sort of had to walk that back in a statement after saying, you know, what I what I meant to say was we were prioritizing the people affected first. Um so, you know, a little bit of a communications problem there. Um, the NDP is calling for, you know, sort of a broader inquiry into what went wrong on this. Um, but, you know, from, from everything that the, the government said, the public health officials said, you know, they, they are most likely going to get to the bottom of this. Um, and hopefully everyone who's in hospital recovers and it uh, doesn't get any worse. Tyler, the province also moved to overhaul the bail system to prevent repeat offenders from doing some of those serious crimes. Officials say the first thing they're implementing is a dedicated urban crime prosecution unit. What will that really look like? Well, they're basically going to be focusing on sort of urban crime in Edmonton and Calgary, I believe. Um, and so that's going to be things like, say, drug houses. That are, there are problem houses in certain neighborhoods. You know, these teams that ha will have sort of liaisons with the police and, and social services and things like that and really sort of focus on some of these, these particularly problematic um, issues. Now, all of this, of course, is coming in response to the sort of increased amount of crime that we're seeing across Alberta and cities, rural areas, and across the country as a whole. The second one is they're going to eliminate what's what's been in place since 2017, and this is a triage protocol among Crown prosecutors. 
Now, back in 2016, the Supreme Court of Canada had a ruling called the Jordan decision. And what that did is it set a ceiling, basically, on how long it could take a person to go to trial. So if you're charged with a crime in September 2023, um, you basically have 18 months before that case needs to go to trial, or 30 months. It sort of you know depends on, on the case. But, but you have a ceiling. The case needs to go to trial in this amount of time. And so in 2017, this triage protocol came in. And what it meant was that Crown prosecutors focused on the most serious, the most significant, the cases that they were most likely to secure convictions on. And then in the other cases, they might, for example, seek plea deals. Um, the sort of controversy over this is that, of course, that leads to fewer crimes being prosecuted because they're seeking plea deals, et cetera, et cetera. So if the government drops this, you know, they're, they're going to be prosecuting more crimes. That's the idea, that more crimes are going to go through the court system, lead to convictions perhaps, lead to more jail time perhaps. Um, the, the question is whether or not I think Crown attorney offices are well staffed enough, have the resources necessary to do this. Because, of course, the more crimes you prosecute, the less attention, the less people there are to take on some of these more serious ones, the ones that are coming up against those Jordan deadlines. So that's going to be quite interesting to see, I think, how how um, the prosecution service across the province tackles that, how many more Crown prosecutors are going to be hired, what the funding is going to look like, so on and so forth. There's more to come from Hal Roberts and Tyler Dawson after this short break, including Premier Daniel Smith's announcement to incentivize carbon capture technology development. There has been much heated debate in Alberta surrounding our energy and gas sector. Adding fuel to the opposition's fire was the UCP's announcement of a seven-month pause on green energy projects. But now Daniel Smith's UCP government has said it will roll out incentives for carbon capture, utilization and storage projects. Alberta correspondent for the National Post, Tyler Dawson, explains more with Hal Roberts. Tyler, Premier Daniel Smith says Alberta will have carbon capture incentives developed by the end of November. Now, this should really encourage more technology development and the installation of that particular technology, will it not? That's the idea. Um, you know, carbon capture and storage is a really integral part of Alberta's sort of plan to get to net zero to, to reduce emissions over the next 25 years or so. And, it, and it's also, you know, going to be key if we're going to hit the Liberals' sort of net zero deadline for the electricity grid, which I think is 2035, unless I'm completely blanking on that. So there, there's this desire to have some sort of tax credit incentive program to sort of develop these technologies, to get them installed on power plants and, and whatnot. The other thing that's kind of interesting that's happening on this front is Alberta's in discussions with the federal government to see what sort of other mechanisms, other levers can be pulled um, to, to get this done. So there's this whole sort of working group that Alberta's uh, got with the federal government right now on some of these sort of energy things, you know, which is, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you know, they're, they're playing nice a little bit over here while still yelling at each other in public. Um, so that's just another, uh, I would say, component of these, these broader discussions, looking at some source of cooperation between, between the governments. So now the province is also negotiating with the federal government to get federal tax credits and incentives in line with what the province really wants to achieve? Yeah, that seems to be the case. You know, say Alberta offers a tax credit for carbon capture and storage. Well, maybe the federal government can, maybe there's some grant funding or a tax credit that the feds can offer as well to sort of, you know, further incentivize this sort of development. Let's talk about West Texas Intermediate for just a moment here, hovering over $80 US a barrel. That could really help boost our bottom line here in the province. Could we potentially see any dividend checks like Ralph Bucks so many years ago? I don't know. You know, that does seem like the sort of thing that a populist premier like Daniel Smith might go in for. But, you know, I, I do think this government has a good number of spending priorities. Um, you know, if you look at their mental health and addictions file, for example, building treatment centers, hiring professionals, I mean, there's there's big expenditures, I think. I mean, there, there's no sort of easy way to get around it. This is a pretty big spending conservative government. So I, I think there's a lot of priorities that they're going to want to put money into. Um, it wouldn't surprise me, though, if we saw some more affordability measures. I, I don't know what those would look like, but that certainly wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, the fiscal update a couple weeks ago now, I think they'd said that they were looking at a $2.4 billion surplus. And, and with oil prices sort of seemingly on their way back up, you know, everyone in the industry is sort of predicting a, a strong finish to 2023. That, that could 
boost um, some of the numbers that the Alberta government's looking at coming into budget season next year. And so, you know, you have to wonder where that money is going to go. Is it going to be affordability? Is it going to be some of these policy priorities? Um, is it going to be rebuilding the Heritage Savings Trust Fund? Is it going to be paying down debt? You know, it, right. in all likelihood, it's a, it's a combination of all those things, I would suspect. But um, certainly better than, you know, going back to the days of uh, what we were trading at negative prices not all that long ago. Now, Tyler, there's also some talk that Premier Daniel Smith may invoke the Sovereignty Act this fall over fears of a production or emissions cap by Ottawa, speaking of oil. The, the question is whether or not that emissions cap is going to amount to a production cut. Um, the oil and gas sector says it almost certainly will lead to a production cut. Um, and, and this is obviously rather unpopular with Alberta's Conservatives. And so there is some talk, you know, among punditry and stuff like that about whether or not this is the sort of thing that the Sovereignty Act might be used for. You know, it, it was, I think, always unlikely that the Sovereignty Act was going to be used for some sort of small potato policy files. Um, and, but these do seem like the sort where they might try and do that. So as, as we've talked about before, you know, the question is, what does this actually look like? If the Sovereignty Act is invoked, if the motion is brought to the legislature and passed, um, what does that actually do? And, and primarily, it seems to be that will forbid Alberta government officials, bureaucrats, etc., from cooperating with the federal government on these files. So does that do anything? Well, maybe, but also maybe not. You know, there's an awful lot the feds can just do on their own. They have their own bureaucrats and their own police force and their own whatever. So, it, but, you know, it, it's primarily, I would say, political if it goes down that road, you know, on, on some of the electricity grid stuff on this oil and gas emissions cap, um, you know, there's probably a pretty strong political impetus for the, for the UCP to go down this road. Um, but as we've always talked about, you know, the, the effect of this, I think, is very much up in the air. And don't forget, if you wish to see more of what we have to offer, you can watch full interviews and stories, including more from Tyler Dawson, by heading over to our website, bridgecitynews.ca. The website's at the bottom of your screen, or you can scan this QR code to get to our homepage. We'll be right back. Welcome back. A dance production based on the life of a residential school survivor is coming to Lethbridge this weekend. The show also has the blessing of the former singer of Genesis, Peter Gabriel, to incorporate a few of his songs. BCN's Micah Quinn sat down with the staff from the production of New Blood to hear about the special show. All these kids who are participating, their grandparents and parents went to residential school and they are playing their parents in the show. It's it's quite powerful. So we just hope as many people will come out as possible. Deanne Birch, the director of New Blood, says the production tells the story of Chief Vincent Yellow Old Woman. He is a former chief of Sixiga Nation. Sixiga Nation is just west of Strathmore, just off Highway Number One. It started 14, no, 10 years ago when I went to visit Writing on Stone Provincial Park, and I was just so moved by going on a trip of the pictographs. And the Blackfoot elder, she was a tour guide and she told us many of the stories had been lost because when the Blackfoot people were put on reserves, they were no longer able to go back to the pictographs and learn of their history. And so it was my dance class that I was working with at the time. And we collaborated with the Blackfoot language class and their teacher, Eulalia Running Rabbit. And then one of the boys in the class, Hayden Yellow Old Woman said, Mrs. Birch, you need to talk to my grandpa. And he gave me this little ripped up piece of paper with a phone number. And three days later, I found it when I was going through my laundry and I called it and it was Chief Vincent. And he invited me to Six Sigga and he told me his story of going to residential school and his battle with addictions and his story of healing and becoming chief of his people. So we knew we had inspiration for a story there. Famous singer songwriter Peter Gabriel sent in a video a few years ago giving his blessing to Birch to use songs from his album New Blood for the production. Gabriel said he was honored to have such a special part in the show. I wrote a song, San Jacinto, which was sort of dealing with this issue. Um, and, you know, it ends with the words sort of hold the, hold the line. And I think. That's what you're doing with this project. For more information on the show, you can visit newblooddance.net. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. If you were anywhere near 6th Street in Lethbridge earlier this week, you may have seen something very peculiar. 
Instead of people running to catch a city bus, they were pulling one. It was part of the United Way of Lethbridge Southwestern Alberta kicking off their 2023 community fundraising campaign. And part of the event for the very first time, the organization teams had to pull a city bus 75 feet down 6th Street South. United Way supports nonprofit charitable organizations in Lethbridge and southwestern Alberta, and we support their uh, programs to help uh, three different pillars, which is uh, poverty to possibility, uh, all that kids can be, and healthy people, strong communities. And so uh, under that umbrella, we support uh, different charitable organizations that will help uh, basically help people uh, get out of poverty and uh, support those types of causes. The executive director for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Lethbridge, Jen Visser, says they feel very privileged to receive so much support from the United Way. We're one of the longest uh, relationships the United Way have, and that's not just in Lethbridge, that's across Canada. Uh, having support from the United Way means that we can provide programs to children in Lethbridge and surrounding area with a volunteer mentor, and that just for us, if we couldn't do that, we couldn't provide that program. So stuff like this is really great for our community to see and be involved in and know that every dollar you give to the United Way has an impact in our community. All the funds raised for the Pull the Bus event go to support the United Way's programs and its support of nonprofits. The United Way Community Fundraising Campaign will, will run until December. The goal this year is to raise $296,000. Youth One has officially launched an expansion of its site, which includes a new after school sports program. The initiative is aimed at organizing pickup sports for children. Officials say it was developed after there was a need for kids who wanted to play sports but either didn't have access to them or couldn't afford to play them. It was a need that we were asked and uh, so we tried to fill that. Uh, the, it gets us really excited because um, we know that youth really thrive when they have opportunities to engage in sport um, and it, it gives them that social context to to like engage with their peers, but then we we try to provide a safe place for that to happen as well. So uh, when we bring in our volunteers and our team members, uh, we set up a space where uh, anyone can come and play and, and enjoy uh, whichever game we're playing. The program caters to kids 11 to 18 and will be available Monday to Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m. You know, you don't have to go very far in Lethbridge to see the challenges with addictions and homelessness. Thankfully, we do have some dedicated people and organizations committed to providing help. Up next, we speak with the co-founder of a mission who is doing just that.